Demand for Web 3.0 developers is off the charts. There's so many different companies in this space trying to build the next generation of blockchain-based applications, and they all need to hire developers. But there's a huge problem. You know, the number of people who actually have these skills is relatively small compared to the demand, which is a great opportunity for you if you're watching this channel. But if you want to land your first blockchain job, you, of course, need the skills to pay the bills. You need to understand the programming languages and how to create applications. You need a winning portfolio that demonstrates that you have these skills. But oftentimes in your job interview, you're going to get asked high level technical questions that show whether you understand how the technology works. And that's exactly what I want to help you with today in this video. I'm going to give you 10 interview questions that are going to help you prepare for your blockchain job interview. I'm going to talk about this as a blockchain developer myself who's been on every single side of this problem. You know, I've worked a regular developer job. I've been a freelancer and now I also hire developers to work for me. So before we get into that, you know, if you're new around here, hey, I'm Gregory and on this channel, I turn you into a blockchain master. So if that's something that you're interested in, then smash that like button down below for the YouTube algorithm and subscribe to this channel. And also, if you're trying to land a highly paid blockchain job in 2022, then the Dappy Diversity Blockchain Bootcamp is the best way to do that. And we're relaunching the Blockchain Bootcamp version 2.0 this Thursday, July 14th. So make sure you sign up with the link down below to hold your spot today. All right, so let's get into this list of 10 interview questions for blockchain developers. So I want to clarify what this list is, okay? So this is focused on the Solidity programming language. Again, Solidity is the main in-demand programming languages that blockchain developers need to know in the industry. And I got a list of 10 questions here that I found over at Turing.com, and I'm going to go through each of these because they're going to demonstrate whether you encountered these problems in Solidity before and are prepared to answer these. Now, you know, you don't know what questions an interviewer is going to throw at you, but this is going to be a good starting point and it might uncover things that you don't understand yet that might cause you to go explore these concepts more in depth so you can be better prepared. So I'm going to go through these questions one by one and actually answer them and provide you examples that accompany each answer. So let's get started. All right, so let's look at this first one. So is it accurate that private variables are truly private? So what does that mean? So basically, if you look at this contract example that I have here, uh, this is my contract, it's a simple Solidity contract that has a constructor function that you know lets you put a contract in the blockchain. And it has two arguments. One is for a, a string variable called value, and one is for a string variable called secret. Now, the uh, value variable is stored uh, with a public visibility, and the private, uh, this one, the secret, is stored with private visibility. So this is a private variable. Basically, the public variable can be read and accessed outside of the smart contract, and the private variable cannot. So if I deploy this contract to the web, or to the blockchain, excuse me, um, you can see here that I can set hello world as the uh, value publicly, and I can say my super secret as the private secret. Now, when I deploy to the blockchain, uh, you know, Solidity is going to give me a function for free where I can access value, you know, hello world, you can see that here. Uh, but it doesn't give me a function that lets me read secret. Now, the question is, is this truly private? So if I deploy this to the blockchain, could someone find out what the value of secret actually is? And the answer is, uh, it is not private. And yes, they can find out what the value of secret is, because while you may not be able to see it easily with the smart contract, you can easily decode the data if you have access to the deployment transaction whenever it's put on the blockchain. For example, this is a contract creation transaction on the blockchain. Okay, this is whenever contracts were created. And anytime this happens, if somebody has access to this and they can decode the input data for the contract and when it was put on chain, they can easily read the value of what that secret private variable was. So no, the variable is not private. All right, so the next question is, what is a smart contract ABI? So an ABI is just a JSON interface that describes how the smart contract behaves. So what does that mean? Well, essentially, you know, when you're creating smart contracts, you have the, you know, human readable code, okay, which is this, this is Solidity source code that gets compiled down and run the EVM. And then you can have a JavaScript or a JSON, I should say, description of how the smart contract works, but not everything that every single function does. So if this has a constructor function, you know, the ABI is going to show that it has this constructor function, and it's going to tell it what arguments it has, and any other, you know, functions or events that might be contained inside the smart contract. So you can easily get an ABI for a smart contract by going to the compile step here and remix and then copying the ABI. I'll just paste in my text editor here. You can see what that looks like. Basically, it just shows you, you know, what the inputs look like. So it just shows you it has a string, value secret, okay, uh, you know, string for uh, value, okay, and that's in, that's in the constructor function and then all this other stuff, okay. This, this shows you how to read the string from the public variable. So if you want to find the contract ABI for any contract that's verified, you can go to Etherscan, look at the contracts tab, and then scroll down to the contract ABI, and you can see uh, an example right here. 
All right. So the next question is, what is the equivalent of JavaScript console dot log in Solidity for debugging? So the answer is there isn't one. Okay. Solidity does not have this capability out of the box, but there are some workarounds. Okay. So one workaround is that you can go to your smart contracts and create uh, your own events inside Solidity. So, you know, Solidity supports events where you can, uh, you know, log anything into any transaction that you want to. You can create arbitrary events. So you can create an event like this, event console log. You can name it whatever you want to and just pass in a string uh, or whatever you want to here with the message. And then you can emit that event any place that you want to debug something in your code where you suspect something might be going wrong. Okay, so here's an example of that. You can also use Hardhat's console logging feature. Okay, so Hardhat has a smart contract development framework where you can import a Hardhat console uh, into your contract like this. And you can also have a function that looks like this, console.log. And you can use a syntax that looks exactly like JavaScript. All right, so the next question is, how can you protect yourself from a re-entrancy attack? Okay, so in order to understand this question, you need to fully understand what a re-entrancy attack is. I've got a video on my YouTube homepage pinned here in the free courses section. You can look it up, how to hack smart contracts with re-entrancy. It's going to show you how to do that step by step and also how to protect your smart contracts against that type of thing. Now, inside that contract, this we have a function that's vulnerable to re-entrancy because basically you can just change the balance by calling the function over and over again and drain the funds uh, with this withdrawal function from the smart contract. So the easiest way to fix this problem is to use an external library like the Open Zeppelin Reentrancy Guard. So you can see that here. Basically, you can import this library into your contract and then make your functions non-reentrant. So that's the easiest way to do it, but there are some other solutions which are outlined in this answer. So you can lower balances and update other state variables before invoking other the contract. You, know, you can re implement the reentrancy guard like I was just talking about, or you can limit the amount of gas available to the contract. Okay, so the next question is, what are the two APIs that a smart contract uses to interface with it? So this is kind of a confusing question. You might ask somebody to clarify what they mean by that. Uh, but the real answer is, uh, it just really supports two basic APIs. So the first is, you know, ETH uh, send transaction and uh, also ETH call. So these are just the two different ways that you can interact with smart contracts because you can only really do two things. You can read information from the smart contract or you can create new information on the blockchain by creating a transaction. So the first way is reading. Okay, so ETH call RPC method. This stands for, uh, you know, the R RPC is the uh, way that you communicate with an Ethereum node. So if you were talking to the blockchain with like Ethers JS or, you know, Web3.js, it's using JSON RPC underneath the hood. And ETH call is the fundamental, uh, you know, RPC method that's called whenever you're fetching information from the blockchain from the smart contracts themselves. Okay, so anytime you're going to read information, you're doing ETH call. Here's the different parameters that go into that transact that 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 call. Okay, and then for ETH send transaction, this is anytime you're, uh, you know, writing new information to the blockchain and you actually have to sign a transaction, you have to pay a gas fee. That's how it's different, right? So underneath the hood, if you're using Ethers or Web3.js, uh, the RPC method is ETH send transaction, and these are the available parameters in that call as well. All right, so next question is, what is the payment method for gas? So, you know, if you're using a blockchain like Ethereum, uh, of course, first and foremost, the gas is paid by the native cryptocurrency of that blockchain, in this case, Ether, okay? So if you create a transaction, you pay the gas fees in Ether itself. So similarly, if you use a different EVM compatible blockchain, you're paying fees in that specific blockchain's cryptocurrency. So now let's talk about what gas actually is, okay? And then how you calculate gas cost uh, for a specific function call. So each function has a specific gas cost. So the gas is really, the gas required is just uh, the representation of how computationally as expensive it is to run a function. So let's say that a function costs 500,000 units of gas. Okay, that really is just the computational cost of doing that. And gas is an express unit. Just like the amount of gallons it takes for you to drive a mile in your car, it's going to cost, it's going to take X number of gallons to drive, you know, 100 miles or 100 kilometers or liters, however you say it in your country. Okay, um, and then we do the same thing. We say that a function costs, let's say, 500,000 units of gas to execute. And then we just multiply that by whatever the gas price is in the current network to get the actual cost, the ether cost that it's going to take to uh, perform that transaction. So, you know, let's take an example. Let's just say the function, like I said, costs 500,000 units of gas. That doesn't mean it costs 500,000 ether or 500,000 GUI to perform. You take 500,000 and you multiply it by, uh, you know, let's say 37 GUI, which is the current, uh, you know, high gas price. So you say, you know, 500,000 times 37, 
that's this much gway for the actual function call. Okay, then I pop that into a simple unit converter for ETH. And then, you know, here, that's this much ether for the actual uh, function call itself. This is how much ether it's actually going to cost. And then, of course, you can multiply this by the U.S. dollar amount uh, exchange rate for ether to get the actual USD value. All right, so what are the requirements for deploying a smart contract to the Ethereum network? So we'll go through these one by one. So the first is the byte code of the smart contract. We're going to get into that here in this next question, actually. So if you go to my example earlier from Remix, if I want to put this contract to the network, I can first compile it and then take this human readable code and turn it into byte code, which you can see after you do compilation. Okay, uh, let's just see here. So it doesn't like my console log from earlier. Let's just take that out. All right. And then let's try it again. Okay. And then basically, uh, let's compile. And I can copy the byte code. And if I put it into my text editor, it just looks like this, okay? So this is all just machine-readable code the blockchain is actually going to understand uh, to put the contract on the network itself. So that's the first thing. You need the byte code. All right, the next thing that you need, uh, let's just see here, is an Ethereum address with sufficient Ether. So, of course, you know, inside of Remix, okay, uh, if you're going to do this, you, of course, need a MetaMask wallet install with an account. And it needs to have some uh, Ether in the wallet to pay the gas fees, okay? Because, you know, when you're putting a contract to the network, it costs money, it costs gas because you're creating a transaction. You're doing a, a write. Um, next is a wallet on the transaction. That's MetaMask, like I just talked about. And then a pool to create the transaction to coordinate the signing process with the wallet. So in this case, you know, uh, you know, Remix would be doing that. You could compile the contract and then deploy it uh, with this one-click deployment tab, or you could do it, you know, with a uh, framework on your computer, uh, like Hardhat, for example, which we talked about in that previous question. All right, so the next question is, what exactly is EVM bytecode? So there's a pretty good explanation here, but let's just really simplify it before we get in depth. So essentially, what you're seeing here is Solidity source code. Source code is what humans can read and understand and manipulate. Uh, you, you know, reads somewhat like English, where you can give it English names, uh, okay? And then you can easily understand and reason about how to change this code to tell the computer what you want to do. Now, uh, in order to run this program, you essentially have to compile it. You have to go through the compilation step here, all right, and turn it into machine-readable code that a computer can understand, okay? And that's what this byte code is that I copied here and showed in my uh, text editor previously. You know, this is code that uh, a computer can understand. So this is what gets run on the EVM or the Ethereum virtual machine, okay? That's what, you know, EVM stands for. That's what the question is asking. So what is the EVM? So, you know, of course, a blockchain is a peer-to-peer -peer network of nodes or computers that all talk to one another, okay? And each one of these uh, computers runs the software, in this case, that essentially runs Ethereum. And, you know, collectively, all these computers together uh, make up what's called the Ethereum virtual machine. So this is the execution environment that runs the blockchain-based programs um, that are created with smart contracts. And so basically, uh, if you're creating a blockchain-based program with smart contracts with human readable source code like Solidity here, you compile it down, you get that bytecode, you generate this uh, EVM-compatible bytecode that all these different nodes can run to actually make your application work and run on the blockchain. Okay, so the next question, is it feasible to send a transaction without having to charge customers for gas? So really a question here is, you know, whenever you're doing a transaction, you know, the customer has to pay the gas fee. They want to know, can you create an application that pays those fees for them? So the answer is yes. Okay, so how would you do it? Um, now, it kind of changes how the blockchain application works, but let me explain it. So you can have people sign messages, okay, that, that, that show their intent to do something, and then you can have the application actually execute that transaction and pay the fee for them. So in this case, uh, you could see an example here of how to sign a message inside Ethers.js. Essentially, you can, uh, you know, create a message here. This message is hello world. And then basically, you can use await wallet sign message and then pass in the message. And what this is going to do is actually encrypt the message uh, with their private key or sign the message with their private key that uh, the blockchain can understand has actually been signed by that person to verify their intent. So basically, you do that, and then you could go send this to uh, some sort of off-chain uh, storage. Maybe it's inside of a you know centralized server or something like that. I realize that kind of breaks decentralization, but that's that's the solution to the problem that they're talking about here. And then essentially, that off-chain uh, you know entity could then you know fund that transaction. Essentially, they could take the transaction that you signed that you intended to do and then pay for it. So you can see an implementation of that inside this contract here. You can see this verifier. 
basically they can pass in the string and then uh, these different values that correspond to your signature. And then they can verify, you know, with assembly inside of here that you actually intended that, that you in fact did uh, sign this message and then they can create a transaction uh, with what you intended to sign in the first place. And that's essentially how you create, um, you know, uh, an application that pays the user's gas fees for them. Okay, so the next question is, what is a library and how many types are there? So a library is really just some reusable code that you can import into your smart contracts so that you don't have to reinvent the wheel every time. So, you know, example might be Safe Math is a really popular library where you want to do mathematical calculations um, and you don't want to reinvent that wheel every time that you, you know, do that in your smart contracts. So essentially, you can see uh, that you can import a library like this. This is one of the most common ways where you can take it from a different file. Okay, you could download it with NPM or something and call import into your project, one of these two ways. And then you'll see the library like this. This is just reusable code that you can uh, add to your contract, or you can do it the second way where you have the library in view. You might just copy and paste it inside the same file. This is in a different file. Okay, and then you basically, you know, you just, um, you basically use this library like this, you know, using math library for uint. Okay, and that pulls the library into your code, and then you have access to this multiply function that you may not have had somewhere else. So that's the, the first most common way is to have libraries that you have on your computer, right, where you have the source code inside your contract. But the other thing about smart contracts is, you know, think about this way. If a library has been deployed once to the blockchain, uh, there's kind of no point necessarily in redeploying that library all the time because, you know, once on the blockchain, it's, it's out there and anybody else can use it. So you can access existing libraries out there without having to pay the gas costs of deploying that each time. So you can basically link your library to an existing one on chain. And all you got to do is go through the steps and remix, okay, to link that contract and then make access of the uh, deployed contract that's on chain without having to pay that gas cost every single time. All right, so that's a list of top 10 interview questions that will help prepare you for the blockchain job interview. So I hope you like this video. As always, smash that like button down below for the YouTube algorithm. Subscribe to this channel if you haven't already. That really helps these videos out so the more we can learn about blockchain. And if you want to land your first blockchain job, then the DAP University Blockchain Bootcamp is the best way to do that. And we are relaunching the Blockchain Bootcamp version 2.0 this Thursday, July 14th. So make sure you hold your spot at the link down below today. All right, so that's all I've got. And until next time, thanks for watching DAP University.